Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes, as we are all watching what is going on in Ukraine. I thought it was very appropriate that we invite on today's guest. Mark Hurtling is a retired lieutenant general, a CNN military analyst. He is the former commanding general of the U.S. Army Europe and the 7th Army. General Hurtling, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be with you, Charlie. Thanks for asking me. As I mentioned before we, we started, uh, my late father would find it amazing that I'm having a conversation with the commanding general of the 7th Army since he served as a sergeant in the 7th Army in World War wow. II. So it was, uh, I appreciate you joining us. It's, it's fun. And, and the history of the 7th Army, not a whole lot of people know because everybody always likes to talk about Patton and the 3rd Army, but the 7th did some pretty fascinating works and had some tough fights during World War II in not only Africa, but in Italy, as you well know. And uh, it's fascinating to walk the ground that those heroes before us walked. But thanks for your father's service. It's interesting you mentioned that because, of course, I, I grew up hearing about the the Seventh Army because my, my father served in the Seventh Army in North Africa and then in Italy. And, and my mother's first husband actually was a captain who who earned the Silver Star in North Africa and then uh, was uh, killed in action in Sicily. So I have always followed the Seventh Army, but let's talk about what's happening in Ukraine today. And I, I let's start with a story that a lot of people are having a hard time getting their heads around. This apparent dispute, uh, misunderstanding, conflict between the United States and Poland over what to do with these MiG-29. So let's just talk about your take on what happened over the last 24 hours. Poland makes an announcement that they're willing to turn over these MiG-29s to the United States in transit to Ukraine. The United States says, what? We didn't, we don't know anything about that. That doesn't really work for us. What do you think? What's happening? Yeah, I think this is going to be an interesting story when all the details get out. I know some of the details that occurred and obviously can't talk about all of them. But this was, as you know, as, as recently as Sunday, there were some officials in the Polish government who basically told the press that they were going to provide these MiG-29s to the fight in Ukraine. And it was subordinate officials to the president of Poland, uh, President Duda, then said, uh, well, no, that's not quite right. We haven't talked about this. So there was confusion from the very beginning, but it took on a life of its own within the American press and the international media saying, hey, this is great. Poland's going to give MiG-29s mm -hmm. to, uh, to Ukraine. And it became, why aren't they there yet? And how come we're not doing this? And how come the U.S. isn't pushing it? And as we saw from a couple of undersecretaries of defense and state, they were unaware of the offer. They didn't know the conditions of the offer from the Polish government. They were trying to work through it. It, it would have been a terrific transfer of, of equipment to Ukraine's Air Force, but it was an uncoordinated action with a lot of politicians making announcements and a little bit of confusion on both sides. Anytime you do a weapons transfer like this, Charlie, as I'm sure you know, there's a lot of details that go into the fight. Uh, who's going to take the aircraft? How are they going to be repositioned? What kind of ammunition maintenance and landing are they going to have? What's the rules of the deal? And, and while all that sounds like bureaucracy, it also <laughs> describes, unfortunately, how the systems work in terms of getting new equipment into a fight especially a fight that's ongoing and in an airspace that's somewhat contested between Russia and, and Ukraine. So as both governments work through this, I think an, an announcement was made yesterday, let's just send them to Ramstein and let yeah. the U.S. take care of them. Well, that brings another escalation effort. First of all, what if they are flying out of Ramstein Air Base? That indicates the, the major U.S. air base in Europe is going to support a fight by Ukraine, which is all well and good, but it's also sort of contentious from the standpoint of how the Russians see it. And does that escalate and bring the United States into the war? And how do you get the pilots to Ramstein to fly them out? And do they return to Ramstein? And where do they land inside of Ukraine? So you can see that the details of this fight, which a lot of Americans who just hear, hey, let's give MiG-29s to Ukraine, we're not worked out. And that's critically important in a contested environment like we're in right now. But I would suggest, Charlie, by the end of all this, sometime some Washington Post or New York Times reporter is going to tell the rest of the story. And uh, a lot of Americans are going to be impressed with how disconnected and dysfunctional the original arrangements were. 
So I think you you touched on this, but the flying of those planes into Ukrainian airspace in and of itself is very difficult, very dangerous. And is there concern that that would be considered an act of war to actually fly from NATO airspace to cross over into Ukraine? A- absolutely. Absolutely. It's, a, it's a, an immediate escalation. And my belief is that's what the Biden administration has been attempting to avoid uh, from turning this from a regional conflict into a global conflict. As soon as something is launched from within the NATO territory to counter any kind of Russian action, it now takes on a whole different dynamic and uh, it could cause an immediate escalation, which then sometimes is really tough to, to keep from spiraling into the unanticipated. I mean, if anyone's a historian and has read The Guns of August uh, about the 1914 uh, beginning of World War I, it is exactly these kinds of actions that created a regional conflict in the Balkans into World War I and killed millions of people. So that's what I know the Biden administration is attempting to avoid, as well as the NATO leadership. And that also applies to uh, President Zelensky's request or demand for a a no-fly zone. That would also be an escalation. Yeah, certainly. Because when when you're talking about a no-fly zone, it sounds sexy and and Mm -hmm. glitzy and gimmicky when you just say, hey, let's establish a no-fly zone and prevent Russian fighters from flying around the area. Well, unfortunately, in a no-fly zone, the way you enforce it is shooting airplanes down that are violating the airspace. It's relatively easy to do. It's still difficult in places like Iraq or Libya or the Balkans when that other country doesn't have nuclear weapons and isn't a global superpower. It also talks, again, about changing this from a regional conflict to a global conflict with the potential for nuclear weapons. And one of the things I've been repeating on, on CNN, when any commander goes into a fight there's always risk of operations that you have to consider, risk to your force and risk to not accomplishing the objective. Commanders will mitigate those risks in a variety of ways, protection of the force, making sure people don't go different places, changing the campaign plan, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're talking about escalating the conflict, what you're then talking about, especially with a superpower that has nuclear weapons, you're changing it from a risk to a gamble. You can't mitigate a gamble. It's win or lose with a gamble. So, you know, what I would say Mm. is that to everyone who's suggesting we should have a no-fly zone, are you ready for the potential of nuclear weapons being used and changing the conflict from hundreds being criminally killed by the Russian army to perhaps tens of thousands or even millions in a global nuclear war? If that's the gamble you want to take, then you might want to consider a no-fly zone. If you don't want to take that gamble, then be careful. So President Zelensky's plan number one was the no-fly zone. Uh, plan right. B was, uh, will send us the jets. So what is plan C? I'm seeing reports now that the United States is providing the Ukrainians with Patriot missile systems. No, they're not providing Ukraine with Patriot missile mm. systems. They're moving Patriot missile system, unless I've missed something in the last mm. half hour, they're providing missile systems to go to Poland, okay. which is on the, the boundary of Ukraine. First of all, the Patriot is a very complicated system. It consists of not only the launchers, but the radars, and, and it has a significant signature. So once you put that in an area, it's, it's called a high-altitude air defense system. So it can shoot down aircraft and incoming cruise missiles at a very high level, which the Stinger system cannot do. A Stinger is a low altitude system. It can pick off jets and helicopters that are flying low to the ground, but it can't really hit some of the aircraft or cruise missiles that are moving at a much higher altitude. The Patriot takes care of that. So I don't think we've offered Patriots inside of Ukraine because that would be a massive escalation in and of itself. We're talking about putting Patriots on the border countries of Ukraine, specifically Poland for the United States missiles. And I'm, I understand that Germany is talking about moving some patriots to Romania, but I may be wrong in that. So what is plan C? What should our strategy be 
at this point. If we're not going to send the Patriot missiles, we're not going to give them the jets, we're not going to provide the no-fly zone. What, what, is, yeah. what is Plan C? It, it, plan C is continuing to do what we've been doing, which is the approach toward not only providing arms and equipment on a very high level. I mean, we're talking about massive amounts of systems that are designed specifically to destroy the kind of weapons that Russia is pushing throughout Ukraine right now. And those are things that we've been doing in a relatively minor scale for the last six years. But over the last two weeks plus, those have increased significantly in terms of tens of thousands of those kind of weapon systems. And everybody talks about the Javelin and the Stinger, but those aren't the only two. There's also a significant increase from Turkey, a NATO ally, of hmm. uh, the, the, the drone systems that have been exceedingly effective against uh, Russian convoys and Russian stationary vehicles. There's also the potential for counterfire radar, which helps the Ukrainian artillery to find where Russian artillery is coming from and counter it with, with weapons. There's also certainly the, the kind of economic issues and, and actions that we've taken that are increasingly making the Russian economy a failed economy on the world stage right now. And that's going to slowly take effect. What you're talking about, Charlie, is what they teach every colonel in one of the war colleges as they're preparing for a strategic assignment is there are four elements of national power. There is public information, public diplomacy, economic issues, and the military. The Biden administration has used every one of those elements of power to counter Russia's attack into Ukraine. Unfortunately, Russia continues against the best interest of their people and the League of Nations to execute a campaign of scorched earth. They are literally killing hundreds of civilians, and we are focused on that killing of civilians. And the hue and cry from the American population is, how can we stop this? Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, it's tough to stop it in the short term. It is going to be a long-term action. Ukrainians are going to suffer during this period, and that's it's horrific and unfortunate. And we're seeing the mass exodus from Ukraine in humanitarian columns. But unfortunately, that is war. And truthfully, Russia continues to target civilians, which is a war crime. And I think they are going to be held accountable for that. But unfortunately, it doesn't stop it now. And that's what Americans want. They want a cessation to this now. And there's really no way to stop it now unless Mr. Putin says stop. So let's pull back sort of the, the big picture here. The U U.S. intelligence officials went up to Capitol Hill yesterday and said that, that Putin's been surprised and unsettled by the problems that have hampered his military in Ukraine. Issues, obviously, that are going to make it a lot more difficult for him to stay in the country, control the country, occupy the country. But they also said he's determined to succeed and he will double down and use ever more brutal tactics. So I guess give me your sense of the play that Yes, there have been tremendous setbacks, you know, obviously massive miscalculation. Russia is a pariah nation. Uh, weaknesses have been exposed. But I'm looking at the maps that have been posted by the British Defense Department, and it looks like they're grinding out, that he may be losing the war in the big picture, but is he going to win the battle? I mean, should we be bracing ourselves for some pretty horrific urban warfare? Yes, we should be briefing that. And, and anyone that knows military operations and has watched Russia over the last 15 years, which I have, know that that is the way the Russians conduct operations. They claim to have operational strike and very savvy approaches to conflict using multiple echelons of forces and key objectives in what we call a gray zone to use asymmetric techniques before they introduce forces. They have not done any of that. So what they are reverting to is what they've hmm. reverted to in several other conflicts over the last couple of years that has been repeatedly reported in, in the media is a scorched earth policy. They are killing civilians in mass. They are bombing civilian targets. They are striking civilian targets, housing complex, schools, churches, people that live in all those places in an attempt 
to eradicate not only the population, but the culture of the nation. And what that also does is strike terror into the population. So they do things like they're doing mm -hmm. right now, which is running for places that are safer. So you have 2 million plus right now civilians who are exiting Ukraine while the Russians continue to bomb their cities and conduct terror operations, which are all in violation of the laws of war in the Geneva Convention with civilian, not military targets. And Mr. Putin, in my view, should be held accountable at The Hague for all of these things. But in order to be held accountable, he has to go there. He has to go to The Hague. And as we yeah. saw yesterday, they wouldn't even send a representative to The Hague to discuss these things because they know what they're doing. They have done these before, and they have not been held accountable in Syria, in their own nation, you know, the attacks in Grozny. They have conducted these kind of operations that I have seen in Bosnia in the early stages of the Balkans war. So this is the Russian way of war. And Mr. Putin has not been held accountable in any of those areas. So to go back to your original question, are we going to see horrific actions? Yes. And I also think we're going to see if we shift our attention away from the civilian population to the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian territorial forces, we're going to see heroic action in terms of them fighting the Russians. And they are going to take, in my view, from what I know about both armies, the Ukrainians are going to take an unbelievable toll on the Russians. And in my view, I'm going to say this boldly, they are going to defeat the Russian army. They will defeat the Russian army. So what does that look like? Well, what you're talking about is right now Russia has by the intelligence estimates that were talked about yesterday, they had surrounding the Ukrainian borders about 127 of their, what they call battle task groups, which are equivalent to combined arms battalions in the United States Army. They have already deployed 125 of those, as we understand it, into the territory of Ukraine. They have also taken their missile systems and their artillery into the territory of Ukraine many of those systems are going to be destroyed. That is about 55% of the combat units in the Russian army. 55% they have deployed into the territory of Ukraine. Now, to give you kind of a comparison, the U.S. military deployed about 24% of our military into Iraq and Afghanistan combined in the headiest days of those two wars. So you're talking about a significant portion of the Russian military. If a country does not have the capability of sustaining and using their security forces, they lose one of their elements of national power, the four that I named earlier. If their economy is in the toilet, they've lost the second element of their national power. If the information on the world stage is that they have become a pariah nation mm -hmm. with a pariah leader, they have lost the third element of their national power. And if no one wants to deal with them from a diplomacy standpoint, and we're seeing that right now, they have lost the fourth element of their national power. So what we're talking about is Russia going from a nation where they believed they were relevant to an irrelevant failed state. Now, the downside of that is Mr. Putin could become very dangerous. And this is right. what the intelligence community briefed yesterday. Yeah. Uh, he could be very dangerous and use some other systems that he have, either cyber or nuclear, to maintain his control of the regime. Again, that, that's where we get into a gamble. Will he do that? He is losing domestic support for this operation, as we've seen in the many protests around Russia in key cities. And he has certainly become a pariah on the world stage. You tweeted out last night the, the attitude that when someone feels that they're waging a war that they cannot afford to lose, that is a very dangerous process. You said if there was ever a thought process that has contributed more to massive and unnecessary human suffering, I don't know what it is. But that is Vladimir Putin's mindset right now, at least yep. as far as we know, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And if you look at history, and I'll just use two examples. Saddam Hussein in 1990, his was the fourth largest army in the world when we started Desert Storm. It was obliterated in a relatively short period of time. 
And for a long time, he had to retreat into his internal domestic issues. And it became almost a failed state. And he could have changed that easily by just withdrawing his forces from Kuwait in 1990 and submitting to the demands of the 30 nation coalition was against him. Adolf Hitler in World War II continued the execution of repeatedly failed maneuvers with his army, with with assassination attempts by his generals against him for the last year of World War II, and he refused to admit unconditional surrender and defeat. So these campaigns, and and by the way, your father was part of that, Mm -hmm. had, had Hitler said, okay, I know I'm defeated, probably in 1942 or 1943, when he truly Mm -hmm. was defeated, if he had admitted it, imagine the lives that would have been saved. Unfortunately, we see Vladimir Putin on the horns of that same dilemma, but his pride and his criminality and his desire to maintain control over an autocratic kleptocracy keeps him fighting. And in the midst of that, what you're talking about is the killing of not only his own army, but the killing of many Ukrainian civilians. So this is why I ask what defeat looks like, because if he will not acknowledge defeat, what is the end game? How does Vladimir Putin extract himself from this? If he holds on to power, how does this end? I I can't answer that question. Yeah. Because how it ends is in the mind of Vladimir Putin. What he is going to do next will end this. And, you know, I, I heard a great quote by by Tom Friedman last night, Mm -hmm. where he said, and I think he wrote an article in the New York Times about it, where he said he can either end early and suffer little, or he can end late and suffer massively. And inflict massive suffering. Right. And inflict. And that's that's why I sent out the tweet after hearing Tom Friedman say that. It is the ego and the hubris of political leaders that continue wars that they know they can't win and that is causing this kind of destruction that we're seeing, but especially on the civilian population of Ukraine, that is confounding to me as a soldier. He has to be getting advice from his generals and his cabinet saying, stop this. Or maybe he's not. Mm. Maybe they are too afraid of him to even offer this kind of advice. But if they're not offering the advice to stop, then they're just as criminal as he is. So I watched you on CNN the other day talking about the four major access advance areas, the way this is playing out. Obviously, we've been focused on Kiev from the north. It looks like they are close to surrounding Kiev. The other going to Kharkiv, essentially northeast Ukraine. The one in the south, which has been called the Crimea approach, uh, you know, separates it into two directions. I want to get to Kiev in a moment. We appear to be bracing for an an assault on Odessa from the sea. What will that look like? And do you think that they are prepared to to launch an amphibious assault from the south? Yeah, I I think that was in their original battle plan if they had achieved success in other places. But what you're seeing is those four or five main axes of advance, which is what military guys Mm -hmm. call what they're doing, in north west and northeast of Kiev, they have not moved that much at all over the last four days. So that tells me either their maneuver plan or their logistics support plan is really dysfunctional. In Kharkiv, as you said, the purpose was to come from the north as well as from the south, in my view, and create sort of a battle of envelopment against the forces in the Donbass. And they have not been able to execute that because they can't get through Kharkiv. They have leveled that city, or at least parts of that city. It's a huge city, so they've leveled parts of it, but they have not been able to open that route to the south where they can link up with the forces from the north. So what, from a tactical perspective, what they are attempting to do now is reroute those elements that have had limited success in Kharkiv onto Kiev to assist in that operation and linking up with the forces coming from the north out of Belarus. I'll get to the Southern approach Mm -hmm. in a minute, but that's the one I'm watching very closely. What has surprised me is we have seen very little activity in the Donbass with the Eastern approach out of Russia into Ukraine. There has been almost limited action there, and that surprises me because that's the territory they want to secure, that it's been sort of a World War I-like type environment for the last eight years with trench warfare. The approach from the South 
they seem to have had a little bit of success in terms of maneuvering forces and resupplying forces. And that's explainable because they have a naval base in Crimea. So they're using that as a base of operation, which they don't have in the north. But in my view, from a military perspective, they have overextended their lines of what we call lines of communications, their logistics support. It isn't just communicating, it's supplies, resupplies coming out of Crimea. So if they open up another attack, hmm. even though they may have estimates are between seven and 11 landing support vessels in the Black Sea, if they open up another attack in Odessa, I actually think that will be critically damning for what we might see next. They may get on the beaches, uh, but mm -hmm. as you said, your father-in-law went into mm -hmm. Sicily and into Anzio. Yeah. Once you try and establish a beachhead, that just drains forces from your operations. Uh, and even with 11 LSTs full of naval infantry, as they call it, you might be able to achieve success on the beachhead, but how are you going to support that beachhead? And, you know, as you said, the maps that the cable news networks are using are not very accurate. If you look at that map of the southern approach, it is almost 400 miles between Odessa and Mariupol. And they're trying to sustain that operation with forces. And then they're going to introduce another force into that area. I, I think if they do that, that will probably be the final dynamic that will cause operational failure on the part of the Russians because they just can't logistically support that kind of an operation. So I'm guessing that Vladimir Putin thought that he would be able to bring Ukraine to its knees in what, 48 hours, 72 hours, that it would be a shock and awe campaign. They haven't yep. achieved obviously their operational objective because of so many reasons that you've described. I mean, you're talking about poor tactics, lack of logistical support, but and I'm sure you've given some thought to this. How could the world and the Russians themselves have misjudged the capability of their army so badly? <laughs> yeah. I, I have given a lot of thought of that. And it's been, <laughs> it's, it's been no surprise to me because I've seen their army. Uh -huh. uh, when I was commander of U.S. forces in Europe, I paid several visits to Russia. And this is, this is in the early 2000s, you know, between 2004 and 2010, when we were still attempting to make uh, engagements with the Russian military. That all ended in 2014 when they invaded Crimea, but there was limited activity between 2010 and 2014. But in seeing their exercises and the way they train on the ground, I was appalled. Their, their <laughs> army was just horrible. Uh, and I could point out the many factors. They have primarily a conscript army. They don't have a professional NCO corps. Their junior mm -hmm. officer leadership is terrible. Their senior officer leadership is corrupt. They don't train on the kinds of things that you need to train in for modern warfare. Their equipment, even though we're impressed by it when it goes through the May Day parade right. in Moscow, is impressive when it's all polished and they're marching in uniform, but they don't know how to imply it on the battlefield. And I think their minister of defense, General Shogu, who is not a military guy, even though he's a general, has been lying to Mr. Putin and probably pocketing a whole lot of money over the last 10 years or so that he's been the minister. So you're talking about a corrupt system that doesn't know how to fight at the junior level, at the soldier level. They Jeez. don't have a morale because they, they are a conscript force and that's most of the soldiers in the army don't want to be there. They want to be somewhere else. They don't have the leadership. Their logistics isn't synchronized. They have a lot of haughty plans that they will publicize about what they plan to do. They used to fight in echelon, which meant the first force would go in, it would be followed by resupply, and then a second force would, would mm -hmm. come in behind them, which would execute the, the final push to the objectives. They have stopped using echelon warfare. That's what we were always afraid of during the Cold War. I'm an old Cold Warrior, so I know how we used to plan for the Russians. But they have almost eliminated that second echelon. You see no second echelon coming into Ukraine right now. They've got the first echelon that's been fighting hard for the last two weeks. And prior to that, they've been encamped in mud holes in Belarus while they've been waiting for the attack. So you're talking about a lot of morale problems in their force, which we're seeing. And you have generals that have lied to their commanders and to the president. 
And so interesting. it's just a culture that is not conducive to conducting operational level warfare to meet strategic objectives. So this is a sub sub standard army, but it still has nuclear weapons. And I guess that's what we keep coming back to is the, yeah. is the, is the, is the end game. You know? Yeah. And we don't know how good their nuclear weapons are. Well, I was going to uh, ask that too. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, but what I would say is whenever you have an exceedingly large army, which Russia has, quantity has a quality all of its own. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing that right now in Ukraine because they are attempting to overwhelm cities. And, and by the way, that's another fault in their plan. Every city they've gone to, and let's take Kiev as an example, 3 million Ukrainian citizens live in Kiev. It is a town the size of the city of Chicago. There is a 30-mile circumference around the city, and it's split by a river. That is a military guy's nightmare to take that kind of a city. It's almost the size of Baghdad. In order to take a city the size of Baghdad, you need probably close to 200,000 soldiers just by itself. And yet they're not only trying to take Kiev and occupy it against a pretty significant resistance and guerrilla war, but they're also doing it in several other very large cities like Kharkiv, which is a, a city the size of Philadelphia, and Mariupol, which has close to 600,000 people, and Odessa, which has a 15-mile coastline. So when you start doing what I would call the military math, the commanders of the Russian force have an impossible mission. And their, their mission design, their maneuver plan, has been to attack into cities. They can't hold those cities. So the only thing they can do is attempt to bomb them into rubble, which is exactly what they're doing right now. But then going back to your other point, you not only have this very large force that is being destroyed by Mr. Putin, but you have a nuclear force, which certainly we may have some intelligence on. They have nuclear weapons. They also have tactical nuclear weapons yes. uh, as a big part of their force. So even that, the use of one tactical nuke of, say, one kiloton or a thousand kilotons, much smaller than what the United States used in Nagasaki or Hiroshima. Just the fact that a nuclear weapon would be used on the battlefield and have the resultant effects of heat, blast, radiation, and electromagnetic pulse, that in and of itself would be a significant event and could escalate this conflict into something we've never seen before. I mean, that's the nature of warfare. What would happen if they did that? A battlefield nuke, which seems like the, again, not likely, but the it's a possibility that they might use one of those nukes. What then do we do? What is the NATO response then? Or are we still just back where we are now? Which is that we don't want World War III. We don't want this out of control, you know, guns of August uh, escalation. Again, if if I were still an active duty general officer, I would probably be involved in those classified discussions, which I know are ongoing right now in the Pentagon and the national security apparatus. What is going to happen next? And just like there was all kinds of planning and assumptions in terms of what is Russia going to do in Ukraine, I think we have probably a, a group of really smart people both in the military and outside the military that are discussing those kinds of courses of action of what would we do next? What would NATO do next if a nuclear weapon or a a massive cyber attack is executed? Charlie, I'm just not privy to those discussions, but I know they're they're tough issues being taken on by the, the people that will have to make the decisions. I think you've answered this question, but what does the Battle of Kiev look like? Uh, It appears that the Russians are going to surround it it's a huge city for them to take, a nightmare to occupy. So are we going to see Grozny, Aleppo? Are we just going to see them try to murder a city in, in front of the whole world? I, I think there is the very high probability of just that. Mm. Um, but I also believe that because the Ukrainian defensive belts around Kyiv are much stronger than they've been at any other place because they know it's the capital and they know it's the objective of Mr. Putin, that you're going to see just a ferocious fight on the ground for the Ukrainians defending that capital city. In my view, I don't think the Russians will get 
inside of the city with any significant force. And if they do, they will be destroyed by Ukraine's military and their underground. So they may, they may surround the city, but they've had enough challenges and difficulties even resupplying and maneuvering to just surround it. I, I can't imagine they would be dumb enough to go inside of the city because they know they will have some significant engagements if they do. But to get to your point, they will attempt to level the city from afar. They will continue to shoot rockets, cruise missiles, artillery pieces that are ranging from anywhere from 17 kilometers to 500 kilometers away and hitting the city from afar. And it's very difficult to deal with that as a Ukrainian army, but they'll never be able to occupy it. You know, what I see long term, Charlie, truthfully, is what happens after the Russians are defeated is there could possibly be a very large effort, sort of like a Ukrainian Marshall Plan, to help uh, President Zelensky rebuild his nation. And it will be the pride of Europe and the world to do so. And again, I'll say this one more time. If Putin is not convicted as a war criminal, he will be a pariah on the world stage after this fight. One last question, because I, I know that you've tweeted about this. What do we know about the Russian generals who've been killed during these military operations? I mean, what, what does it mean? I mean? You've had two generals from the 41st Army killed who are veterans of the Syrian war. One of them fought yeah. in Chechnya. And, and you tweeted out that it was telling. But, and when you, when you read about you know, generals of this rank being killed in combat, what does that tell you? Well, I, I can't remember any historical uh, precedent for two generals being killed in a two-week time, other than perhaps at some time during World War II. But that means that the generals are involved in small unit tactics. And the reason I say it's significant is because fighting at the front, and I, I know some of your listeners that are unfamiliar with the military are going to say, ah, typical general afraid to go to the front. No, I've mm -hmm. been to the front multiple times, but you know as an American general, that if you're killed, it's going to be pretty embarrassing to the United States. So I always had a two-person security detail with me, and usually the unit I was visiting also ensured my security. And it's not because I was fearful of getting killed. It was just a matter of you don't want to embarrass the United States. So if you have two generals from the same combined arms army killed in a week's time, something's wrong. And it's significant because it tells me that these generals are getting involved somehow in tactical actions when they should be considered about operational mm. objectives, uh, supporting their frontline troops, ensuring their frontline troops get the things that they need, ensuring that the plan is going on schedule and according to what was anticipated. So if you have a couple of generals on the front line getting killed, that means they're trying to take over the fight at the front line. And that's never a good thing. Retired Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling is a CNN military analyst, former commanding general of the U.S. Army, Europe, and the 7th Army. General Hurtling, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. It's been a pleasure, Charlie. Thank you. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow. And we'll do this all over again. Hey, it's Rich Eisen. And my first guest of season three of Just Getting Started happens to be the new host of this podcast, my better half, Susie Schuster. You've got one of the most unique stories of how you got started. So why don't you come across the hall, take the chair and, oh boy, wait a minute, I think I, I locked the door. That's not a metaphor for anything. How's the lighting in here? I mean, I'm vain, you know? So I thought for the first season, try to bring you people I thought were diverse and different and maybe interesting and that's why I started off with Jeffrey Ross the comedian and then you know we've got a bunch of other asks out making Paul Rudd do it sorry Paul do you know that you're doing it and I want this to be inspirational life is really hard right now and sometimes you just need a little bit of help someone to reach out their hand and pull you along or to push you from behind and say you can do this and I'm hoping that's what you're going to get from just getting started go follow just getting started wherever you get your favorite shows